mentioned, uh, actually I requested uh, to give two presentations, one an introduction to cryonics and, cry and cryonics technology and another presentation dealing with uh, technical challenges in cryonics. And uh, this has been merged together into one lecture and so uh, there will be both uh, introductory material and uh, technical challenge material. Okay, so the first, the first introductory uh, thing to do is to, is to say what cryonics is. And um, so it's a practice of uh, preserving legally dead humans and animals at cryogenic temperatures in the hopes that future science can restore them to healthy living uh, as well as rejuvenate them so that they can live hundreds of thousands of years in a healthy, youthful condition. So I've underscored and made rejuvenate larger because I think it's really key, uh, really key part of the program. It, there's not, not uh, really much point for a lot of people in uh, rejuvenating and bringing them back after they're um, 80 or 100 years old. And that's one of the large pr problems a lot of people have with this <coughs> idea. They, the first thing they think of is, oh, why would I want to be brought back when I'm still old and sick? And uh, it just misses the point entirely. It's the prospect of rejuvenation, which is, which is good in the excitement about the possibility of cryonics working. And I, I try to emphasize that more and more to so that the public understands what it is we're trying to do and what we're where we're trying to go. So, the next slide. And cryogenics is a word often confused with cryonics, but it actually applies to, uh, it actually is a field of physics or engineering that deals with low temperature. Uh, what low temperature, what that low temperature is, uh, uh, it varies. Some definitions say below 100 degrees Celsius, some say below 150, sometimes they say below 100 Kelvin. Anyway, it's very low temperatures. It's, it's, uh, it's related to cryonics, but it certainly isn't cryonics. Next slide. So um, we're, hope, we're expecting and hoping that future medicine will, is going to be able to cure every disease, and uh, as well as rejuvenate people. And so cryonics is going to be the ambulance we, we uh, uh, take to the future. And uh, so we call the people in that ambulance patients. And um, uh, I've emphasized rejuvenation over, but over and over, but it may take many decades before we have rejuvenation. And um, people may die before that time. So that's why we need the ambulance. And uh, there's also some damage in the cryopreservation process that's going to need to be fixed. So cryonics are really based, uh, people say cryonics isn't science, and to that extent it's true. It's not science, you can't say something is science when it's based on things that don't currently exist. Uh, but it's very reasonable to believe that uh, the repair technologies uh, that we require will exist and that rejuvenation will happen and we'll be able to uh, re uh, repair a lot of uh, the damage that's happening. Next slide. Um, another key aspect of cryonics is the, is the cooling aspect. Uh, we, we know that food can be preserved in a refrigerator or a freezer. Uh, so uh, the lower the temperature, the better the preservation. Uh, children who fall on in cold water have survived over an hour of cardiac arrest with complete neurological recovery. Um, so that's a, another example of preservation. Next slide. Um, the decomposition is partly due to chemical, biochemical reactions and they are in, typically enzyme catalyzed. And um, uh, cooling can slow these reactions and, and the, the extent to which they're slowed is determined by the Arrhenius equation. Next slide. The Arrhenius equation that, <coughs> that tells us that uh, at uh, zero degrees Celsius, um, uh, a reaction will go about one eighteenth this time as fast as it will go at uh, 37 at body temperature. Uh, or stated another way, uh, the reaction goes uh, 18 times faster, 20 times faster at body temperature than it does at, uh, at uh, ice water temperature. Next slide. And carrying that logic further, you can say the reaction goes 400,000 times faster body temperature than it does a dry ice te uh, sublimation temperature, and 10 to the 28th uh, fast times faster than it does at uh, liquid nitrogen temperature, or the boiling <coughs> temperature of liquid nitrogen. And uh, essentially, nothing is happening at all. 10 to the 28th is just, you know, astronomical. Next slide. Um, water molecules interact by hydrogen bonding, primarily. The hydrogen's uh, bond, uh, form hydrogen bonds, they aren't covalent bonds with the oxygens. And uh, the, the natural tendency of water molecules is to arrange themselves in a tetrahedron um, uh, with these uh, 
<coughs> hydrogen bonds. Next slide. And um, so, um, but in, in the in the water in the water phase, uh, the, the tetrahedron uh, can't be easily uh, um, formed, and so the water molecules sort of jostle around and mix to each other. But when you form ice, uh, they form this very nice tetrahedron crystal lattice, and uh, that that this this uh, occupies 9% greater volume than the liquid form does, um, which uh, can be a source of damage. Next slide. Uh, damage by mechanical crushing uh, from the freezing damage from the ice is, is a major part of the problem that ice causes. But there's also osmotic damage, electrolyte damage, and maybe even uh, dehydration damage. So we want to avoid ice formation if we possibly can. Next slide. Um, by analogy, um, quartz, silicon dioxide, uh, actually arranges itself in a similar sort of tetrahedron uh, with silicon in the middle and four, four oxygens around. And uh, so that's an that's example of quartz, the quartz crystal. Next slide. But uh, if you get, can get some uh, sodium ions uh, in, the, in between that uh, lattice, in the, in the crystal, uh, you end up with an amorphous form of quartz. And uh, that's exactly what we have in our window panes and our, our drinking, our, our vessels for drinking, but, um, <coughs> for drink and beverages, <laughs> beverage vessels. Um, anyway, glass, the glass that we're familiar with is, is uh, quartz with uh, um, soda lime and, and calcium oxide that's breaking up this uh, regular crystal formation. Next slide. Uh, so that's so the window panes are made, made of and and uh, that the containers for be beverages are typically made of this soda lime glass. So, uh, it's not a crystal. And um, if you've ever watched a glass blow, you, you'd see that the hot glass is a, is a syrup that uh, as it as it becomes cool becomes more and more viscous and thick and finally uh, turns into a solid state. And the solid state is essentially a very very vic viscous liquid in, in a sense. And uh, if you do that, if you get this vitrification, glass formation, you avoid um, the <clears throat> problem of the, of the tetrahedron formed of the ice and the, the, the mechanical crushing and so forth, uh, as well as the other problems. Uh, next slide. <coughs> and uh, the way we do this is uh, comparable to what we do with glass. Um, <coughs> we use antifreeze compounds as cryoprotectant. And, uh, they uh, get in the way of the hydrogen bonding by the water molecules by hydrogen bonding and clicative action themselves. The most uh, common one uh, that you may be familiar with is, uh, is the ethylene glycol, which is the antifreeze that's used in automobiles. But uh, propylene glycol has been used in ice cream for an ice formation, and glycerol has been used for over 50 years uh, to prevent um, um, ice formation and, or reduce ice formation in um, red blood cells and sperm. And uh, dimethyl sulfoxide is the cryoprotectant that's uh, most preferred by cryobiologists. Next slide, please. Um, so there's been some great bit, uh, achievements with vitrifying uh, biological tissue. Uh, the the brain, rabbit brain has been uh, Bit, vitrified with no ice uh, seen anywhere by electron micro, micrographs. Uh, hippocampal slices have been cooled uh, to solid state and reborn and not only showed no ice formation, but 100% viability. So that, that's, that's two things you're trying to accomplish with uh, ideally, is not only eliminate the ice, but show that tissues can be completely alive. And the fact that it's hippocampal slice in the brain uh, is all the more encouraging. Uh, the greatest achievement to date uh, of vitrification is a rabbit kidney cooled to a solid state, vitrified, um, and uh, rewarmed and transplanted into a rabbit and able to sustain the rabbit as the sole functioning kidney. Next slide. So, uh, as, um, just to re-emphasize uh, vitrification is glass formation. And um, we can get uh, that uh, vitrification of water using crack protections, but cryoprotectants are toxic. Uh, next slide. Uh, really, cryoprotectant toxicity is the number one problem standing between us and reversible uh, suspended animation by cryopreservation. Um, there's some problem with perfusibility, 
if you wanted to, uh, if you wanted to perfuse uh, bones, uh, bones uh, don't perfuse very well because they don't have much water in them. But on the other hand, the fact they don't have much water means you don't get ice formation and much damage. So bones aren't really as big a problem as you might think. Uh, kidneys are actually one of the hardest organs to vitrify uh, because of a perfusion problem. The, the medulla of the inside only receives 2% of, uh, of the blood flow, uh, whereas the cortex receives uh, 98%. So it's this uneven blood flow in, in the kidney that makes kidneys so hard. And, and all, in a sense, it makes it encouraging the fact that they have been able to vitrify a kidney. Um, the brain is, by contrast, it's actually one of the most easy organs to vitrify. Um, if we could vitrify without toxicity, uh, it would be a huge benefit to cryonics. I mean, if we could, if we could demonstrate uh, whole toxicity by introducing the cryoprotectants at a lower temperature, because they tend to be less toxic at lower temperature. And also, it, uh, if you can find a way to cool faster, um, you can use lower cryoprotectant toxicity at, uh, concentrations and thereby lower the toxicity problem. And that's one reason why it's easier to, to vitrify a, a, a rabbit kidney than a human kidney, because a rabbit kidney is smaller, that means you can cool it uh, much faster. Um, so, um, <clears throat> Uh, another thing about the cryoprotectants is if you use them as single agents, uh, they tend to be more toxic than if you mix them. So we try to get different cryoprotectants and mix them together, and uh, then you can use lower concentrations. And you can add ice blockers, that helps too. Uh, next slide. Um, I guess many people, many of the critics, uh, critics say, oh, that you're just doing this to dead people, so what does that mean? You, you know, it doesn't help you. And, uh, so, what is that? Um, before 1950s, uh, people believed, uh, it was believed that if your heart stops, that's it, you're dead, that's the end of the story. And then it was discovered that people could be brought back to life with CPR, or defibrillation, if it was applied within six minutes of the time the heart stopped. Um, but there's a, a misconception that, the, that after six minutes, the brain is destroyed, and all the neurons die immediately. Uh, from the ischemic damage, but that's not that's not what happens. It's the blood vessels that are damaged after six minutes, not the not the uh, brain cells. And if you can't, if nothing can flow through the blood vessels properly, uh, <clears throat> no wonder you can't revive the person after six minutes. Next slide. So it actually, uh, in 1976, Peter Safar showed that uh, he could go back beyond the so-called six-minute limit. Uh, he could perfuse dogs. Uh, uh, dogs survived uh, 12 minutes of cardiac arrest uh, just by uh, some manipulations to what he was using, perfusing with. Uh, elevating the arterial pressure with epinephrine using heparin, a uh, little heme dilution with uh, dextran 40. And uh, uh, just by increasing cerebral perfusion pressure alone, uh, the six minute limit has been extended to 12 minutes. Next slide. 